Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and the title of today's episode is The Top 20 UFO Cases of New York. I've written a number of books about various states, and New York is one of them. And I have to tell you, I think it's one of the most influential in terms of how we view the UFO phenomena. There's an enormous number of cases coming out of this state, of course involving the entire gamut of the UFO phenomena, sightings, landings, onboard experiences, face-to-face -face encounters, UFO crashes, UFO photographs and films being taken, conspiracies, the, the whole deal. So I had a real tough time picking the top 20, and I had to leave out some that I really wanted to include, but I've come up with a list of what I think are the top 20 encounters in New York State. These are the ones that are perhaps the most well-known, the most influential, important, unique, uh, credible, these types of encounters. Um, some I think you will know of, some I'm sure you've never heard before. I think people will be surprised at what the top cases are. Uh, but let's just get started because there's a lot of cases to cover. S the case I chose for number 20 is the UFO display over Glen Falls. This occurred on the evening of August 19. Route 20 of 1974, and really it covered a much more widespread area than just Glen Falls. It included uh, various communities such as Ludenville, Saratoga, Warren, and Washington as well. All of these cities started receiving floods of calls into their local police stations, but it was a really apparently at Glen Falls where most of the activity was centered. People were viewing these blimp-shaped objects, large glowing blimp-shaped objects, darting around, hovering, moving at right angles. Uh, many of these were covered with colored lights, and it was attracting large groups of people to watch this. Uh, in fact, by midnight, more than 100 people were lining Dix Avenue in Glen Falls to watch this UFO display. Uh, police officers arrived, radio stations, many of these people watched one of these objects swoop down and actually hover very low over Saratoga Lake and start scooping water out of it. And it sped away at high speeds. Uh, an hour later, by 1 a.m., there was more than 400 people along Dix Avenue. Uh, traffic by now is completely blocked. Uh, People were seeing UFOs all over the area. There was a pilot flying over this area, and he reported his sighting to Albany County Airport, and they said that they had it on a radar, and they were tracking it at 3,000 miles per hour. Witnesses called Plattsburgh Air Force Base, who denied having any information about the sightings. They had no explanation to explain them, and they also said that they were seeing nothing from their location at uh, Plattsburgh. Uh, so it's a very, very amazing sighting. Uh, really a huge sort of mini wave witnessed by many hundreds of people. And that's why I think it's important. It's also got a weird little twist at the end. Uh, or the day before this whole incident, one of the residents of Glen Falls, Joanne Warren, was in her home when a UFO appeared outside her home. Her whole family saw it, including her young 12-year-old son, Larry, and also her daughter saw it, and all three were watching this object when suddenly they all just passed out. They became unconscious, woke up the next morning, and uh, didn't know what to make of it, but then heard on the radio that evening about the sightings going on at Glen Falls. Uh, so they, they heard about him on the radio, ran outside, and saw all these objects darting overhead. As Joanne Warren says, we saw them, the neighbors saw them. You could go out right in front here where the parking lot is, and you could see all these things zooming all over the place and stopping, zooming here and there. It was not just me that saw it, or Larry, or my friend next door. Half the town saw it. So it was clearly some sort of display. Interestingly, Joanne Warren's son, Larry, 
would later become one of the prominent witnesses in the Rendlesham UFO incident in uh, Bentwaters, England in 1981. So that could perhaps be related, but definitely an important case. The case I chose for number 19 is the Warren Sigmund photographs. It's a very impressive case which took place on May 15, 1955. Warren Sigmund was a television technician. Uh, he was in the heart of New York City. Uh, he was with a very well-known person by the name of Jeanine Boulier, an officer for the French Office de Tourism. And uh, she suddenly shouted out, looked out the window and shouted out, hey, quick, look at that. And Sigmund saw this object, this weird object scooting across the sky. He had a camera handy, so he quickly grabbed it and snapped a series of photos, which clearly show this object moving around the heart of New York City. And I'll just quote Warren here, as he says, I had never seen anything like it in my life. It must have been tremendous in size. It looked like a full moon that suddenly appeared. It was eerie, frightening, fascinating. I didn't know what to do. I could feel myself getting tense all over, but I had to watch this thing, whatever it was. The thing seemed to have an unknown power, giving off that glow and just hanging there in the sky. Then it turned a dull gray and swung lazily over the right and stopped again, just hovering. Then I noticed another strange thing. Even when it was resting in place, the outline was very blurred, indicating terrific movement. No one else was on the roof, and no one else seemed to see this thing. We were alone. But how could that be in a city of 8 million people? Then it moved again, this time to the left, to the original position. It was like a graceful ping-pong ball now. It made a high sweep and settled down at an angle of 45 degrees. This thing had no wings, tail, insignia, or markings of any kind. It left no trail, and it made no sound. It didn't seem to know what gravity was. If it did, it certainly wasn't respecting it. Then su as suddenly as it had appeared, it made a slight turn and vanished. It moved like it had intelligence. This was not mass hysteria or individual hysteria. It was not an illusion or a mirage or a light inversion. I believe the pictures prove that. It's clearly an impressive case, as you can tell by these photos. And there are many other excellent photographic cases in New York. One case that I really want to just briefly mention occurred in June of 1963, again in the heart of New York City. A man by the name of Milton B. saw this object scooting across the sky and managed to photograph it as it hovered directly over the United Nations building. Uh, the object kept moving and he snapped another photograph as this same object hovered over uh, the, or hovered next to the Empire State Building. So an excellent case. Those, these photographs were vetted by Wendell Stevens, a UFO researcher who specialized at one point in UFO photographs. Another case involving photographs occurred on April 12th, 1993. This occur occurred again in New York City, overlooking the uh, Hudson and East River. And uh, this uh, landscape artist was taking photos of New York landmarks when he saw the river bubbling and uh, turned towards it and saw this silvery object rise up out of the river and dart away very quickly. He snapped a series of five photographs. Uh, two showed nothing. Two showed the object, but only as a small dot and a blur. But one very clearly shows this object rising right up out of the river. It's an impressive photographic case. And this again comes from Wendell Stevens in the UFO photo archives. A third excellent photographic case took place in December 1959. The main witness is Dwayne F. Rary. He was outside his home when he saw a strange object and managed to snap a quick picture of it. He described it as a glowing Saturn-shaped object hovering at very low altitude over the house across the street. He felt like it almost posed for him and it clearly shows a solid glowing object with a strange ring around its circumference. 
I like these older photographic cases because I think there's less chance of them being manipulated. Now we move to case number 18, UFO causes plane crash. This is a controversial incident that occurred on July 1st, 1954 over Griffiths Air Force Base. Uh, it began when uh, officials at the base detected unknown objects on their radar scopes. They scrambled an F-94 Starfire jet after this object, and the pilot described a gleaming disk. He said it was huge and circular, and uh, he tried radio radioing the object and asking it to identify itself. He did not get a response other than suddenly his jet engine suddenly cut off and the pilot felt a very strong wave of heat in the cockpit. He says it was like, quote, like a blast from a blowtorch and uh, the pilot ordered his radar man to bail out, which he did, and the pilot bailed out seconds later and both men parachuted to safety. Unfortunately, their plane crashed in the town of Walesville, New York, killing two adults and two children in their home and injuring five others. So this was obviously a very huge incident and uh, the pilots wanted, to, or the press wanted to know what happened and interviewed the pilots and the pilots said that they had encountered a UFO. They later retracted this in later interviews and said it was, quote, engine trouble. Uh, Major Donald Kehoe was a very active investigator at that time for the National Investigative Committee of Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, and uh, he investigated the incident and learned that in the hours following the crash, a large silver UFO had been reported across several communities in the area. Uh, he tried to get information from the Air Force uh, and learned that the Air Force was afraid to scramble any other jets after this object for fear of being attacked, as this first plane apparently had been. Uh, Kevin Randall investigated this case and tried to debunk it, pointing out a confusion in dates, and he learned that there was, in fact, a weather balloon known to be in this area. Uh, most researchers, I think, uh, in my humble opinion, <laughs> I think this is a real event. Um, certainly I do, considering that uh, this object did apparently cause the jet's engines to fail and a blast of heat to occur, and so many people reported this object. In any event, it appears to be a very important case, and that's why I included it. And now we move to case number 17. For 17, I chose the UFO encounter of Jimi Hendrix. There have actually been a number of really famous celebrities in New York uh, who have seen UFOs, uh, a lot of musicians actually. Neil Sedaka saw a UFO over the Catskills. Uh, in 1970s, Muhammad Ali reports that he was jogging through Central Park in 1974 when he saw several UFOs. He talked about them on The Tonight Show and said, I'm convinced UFOs are of tremendous importance to the whole world. Uh, in 1953, Mel Torme saw a UFO and said that it moved faster than his eyes could follow, it was darting around. Uh, in June of 1961, punk rocker Helen Wheels and her brother Peter Robbins saw a UFO and actually had missing time. Peter Robbins would later become a very well-known UFO researcher. So, as you can see, there are many uh, Famous people who have seen UFOs in New York, but what I wanted to talk about here is the sighting by Jimi Hendrix. It's a really interesting case. This occurred in 1965, during the winter of 1965 in upstate New York. Hendrix was driving with his bandmates, including Curt Curtis Knight, when they became stuck in the snow. They got stuck in a huge snow drift and were in danger of freezing to death, when suddenly this UFO stopped down and in the street in front of their car, just parked there, blocking the road. Uh, it, it was cone-shaped, according to Curtis Knight, and uh, sort of looked like a space capsule. Jimi Hendrix, as far as I know, never talked about this 
And Curtis and I had only revealed this after Jimi Hendrix passed away. It's an amazing case. Uh, according to Curtis Knight, this object was giving off heat. Uh, somehow this figure appeared, a very tall figure glowing, and approached the car. And I'll just let Curtis Knight describe what happened in his own words. We couldn't believe our eyes. He stood eight feet tall. His skin was yellowish, and instead of eyes, the creature had slits. This forehead came to a point, and his head ran straight into his chest, leaving the impression that he had no neck. Jimmy seemed to be communicating telepathically with it. At this point, the interior of the van began to heat up. As Curtis Knight said, I was roasting. And then this figure, this tall figure, started to walk around the car, melting the snow. Again, as Curtis Knight says, As it glided behind our truck, I saw that the drift had completely vanished. Turning on the ignition key, I gunned the motor and I got the hell out of there. The object, the strange craft, was at the same time lifting off like a rocket from a launch pad. Jimmy never did talk much about what happened. He sort of let me know that the cool thing to do was not bring up the subject. It was to be our little secret. However, from what he said, I sort of suspect the object arrived to save our necks, chiefly because Jimmy had been practicing trying to communicate by ESP with the beings on board. I know this may, so I know this may be hard to believe, but I'm putting it straight, just like it happened. Uh, so Jimmy said that he had seen a UFO over at a concert once in Maui. And uh, apparently, yeah, he was in contact. And some of his songs actually seemed to reflect that. In fact, uh, he wrote a song called Up From The Skies, which is actually written in the point of view of an ET who has come back to visit Earth after a long absence. And the lyrics are really revealing. The song begins, I just want to talk to you. I won't do you no harm. I just want to know about your different lives here on this people farm. Uh, the ET goes on to say that he's come back to find the stars misplaced and the smell of a world that has been burned. Well, maybe it's just a change of climate. So this sort of echoes the themes of environmentalism that we see in many other cases. Uh, he had another song called Castles Made of Sand, which is about a young girl who was confined to a wheelchair and became suicidal and was about to end her life when she saw a winged ship pass over, and uh, at this point, she was healed. So here we have the theme of healing being uh, revealed, which is another thing that definitely shows up in UFO accounts. It's a really interesting case. Jimi Hendrix is an extremely influential musician, and I find it interesting that so many musicians have had contact with UFOs, and that's why I wanted to include that case. Now we move to case number 16. For case 16, I chose UFO sighting over Lake Tirata. It's a really interesting photographic case, which has generated a lot of controversy, uh, but I think <laughs> is a legitimate case. Uh, this occurred on December 18, 1966. A man by the name of Vincent Perna, a construction worker, was fishing at Lake Tiarati with his brother and friend. Suddenly, this disc showed up. It was copper-colored, sort of a dull finish, uh, very large, disc-shaped. It emerged from a nearby ridge and hovered directly over the lake. It was totally silent and appeared to be about 18 feet in diameter. Uh, per Vincent Perna had a plastic brownie star flash camera, and he quickly snapped a number of photos, at least, at least one of which clearly shows this metallic disc overhead. Uh, he p reported his sighting to the park patrol officers, and uh, they forwarded his report to Stewart Air Force Base. Officials at Stewart Air Force Base were very interested, and r the case was routed to Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book officers interviewed uh, Vincent Perna and the other witnesses and reviewed the photograph, and they pronounced the case a hoax. J. Allen Hynek 
was part of Blue Book at the time, and he was shocked at this conclusion. He was very angry. He disagreed with it vehemently. As he says, and I'm quoting, I find no substantiation for the evaluation of hoax, particularly in view of the photo analysis report. Mr. Beckman, a qualified photo analyst, disagrees with the photo analyst presented in this report as to the distance of the object. He points out that the depth of field extends much farther than indicated in the report. Consequently, no judgment can be made as to the real size of the object. My recommendation is therefore that the evaluation be changed from hoax to unidentified. Uh, but Blue Book refused to change their uh, conclusion. They believed Perna, or they certainly accused Perna, of having a model of some sort and said that this was just a small object very close to the camera. Uh, the photo analyst and Hynek disagreed, believing it was a large ab object some distance from the camera. So this definitely caused quite a bit of controversy. Again, as Hynek says, and I'm quoting, Project Blue Book ignored my recommendation and maintained a file on the Bear Mountain photograph with the hoax label intact. Not really fair to either the scientific method or the character of the witness. But the case wasn't over yet. Uh, reporters from the Rockland News got a hold of the story. Uh, reporters called up Stewart Air Force Base and asked for confirmation. And uh, people at Stewart Air Force Base told them that they believed the, the photos showed nothing more than, quote, a blob of developing fluid. So now they're changing their story. First they said it was a model. Now they're saying it's a blob of developing fluid. NICAP investigators arrived on the scene. They were very interested in the case. They interviewed Perna and uh, actually asked him if he would go under sodium pentothal truth serum. Uh, he agreed, and uh, again, there was no variation in his story at all. Researcher Frank Edwards was very impressed by the case as well. And I'll just quote Edwards here as he says, because of the apparent authenticity of the pictures, they could conceivably become among the most important civilian photos ever taken. So clearly an important and influential case. Now we move to case number 15. I chose Blue Book case number 8739, unidentified. It's only one of 16 cases that Blue Book declared unidentified in the state of New York. As you can see, they were very reluctant to do so, uh, but sometimes they just couldn't get out of it. This case occurred on e April 11th, 1964. The main witness is Warren B. Oshner. He a, was a pilot in World War II and at that time was a physiotherapist. He was out picnicking with his wife and kids uh, in the area outside of Homer, New York. Suddenly they all looked up and saw this black object leaving a weird contrail. This the contrail disappeared, but the black object remained. It kind of took on a, the shape of a banana and then faded out. Shortly later, another object appeared. This one was glowing and looked like a cylinder. It was impossible to determine how large or how high up it was because he didn't know its size. Uh, but he estimated it was about the size of a Navy submarine. That's what it looked like to him. Uh, he was looking at it through binoculars, and he could see flashes of light from one side of it. Uh, it was sort of darting across the sky, uh, maintaining shape. And this is where it started to get really strange. This object changed shape from a cylinder to a uh, saucer-shaped. It then appeared to become spherical. At this point, it divided into two pieces. The top part darted away and uh, the bottom part remained. At this point, the bottom part split it into two pieces. One of them faded away, and the other sped off at high speeds. The whole experience lasted about 45 minutes. According to the witness, uh, he says, and I'm quoting, I have observed a phenomena which is beyond my comprehension and which taxes my sense of reasoning and credulity. So a very 
impressive case, and uh, while Blue Book was trying to debunk a lot of cases, this was one that they declared unidentified. For case number 14, I chose Civil Defense Employee Photographs UFO. This occurred on July 28, 1952, right around the time there had been UFOs seen over the nation's capital. I think that's one of the reasons why this particular uh, incident generated so much interest. The main witness is August Roberts. Uh, as I said, he's a civil defense employee. He was on the roof of the 6th Precinct Police Station in New Jersey when he saw a UFO hovering over the other side of the Hudson River. Uh, he had two other people. They were all watching it through binoculars. The object looked like a large ball of light, orange in color, with a dark brownish rim. And Roberts had a camera with him, and he quickly snapped a photograph. As he says, whatever the object was, I'm sure it was not like any type of aircraft I have ever seen. Uh, since he was a civil defense employee, he reported his sighting to superiors and submitted the photograph. Uh, the military and the FBI actually heard about this case and expressed extreme interest. And for the next 72 hours, Roberts went through an intense and somewhat abusive interrogation. And I'll just quote August Roberts here as to what happened. As he says, For a combined total of three days, my life was virtual hell. They just wouldn't let me alone. What did you see? How is it possible? What do you think it was? They never stopped questioning me. I was so worn out that I had to spend the rest of the week resting up at my sister's home. I was questioned, badgered, threatened, laughed at, and insulted. In the end, they accepted my story. I hope I never have to go through that again. Uh, as I said, I think this generated a lot of interest because officials were trying to figure out what was hovering over the nation's capital. And here they had a photograph of an object very nearby uh, and very close to the same time. That's why I wanted to include this case. And now we move to case number 13. For case 13, I chose a UFO repair case. This is an incident in which witnesses observe an apparently disabled UFO being repaired by UFO occupants. This particular case was investigated by Ted Bloicher and Dr. Bertold Schwartz. They're both very well-respected and well-known UFO researchers. This case also appeared in Dwight Connolly's book, world's best UFO cases. Dwight Connolly was the former editor of the MUFON UFO Journal. So yeah, very good case. This took place in New Berlin, New York, just northwest of the Five Corners area. The main witness is Marianne Hatzenbuehler. This occurred on November 25th, 1964. On that evening, Marianne was in her home when she saw a shooting star drop from the sky, followed by a second one. She realized that these were not shooting stars when the second object assumed a horizontal trajectory and started traveling along the creek bed next to Highway 84, heading towards her house. She ran outside and observed this thing as it came above the highway and started chasing cars away. It actually followed one car down the highway for a short distance. Marianne called out her mother to observe this. Her mother came running out and saw it as well, screamed in fear, and went running back inside and begged Marianne to come back inside. Uh, Marianne refused. She wanted to see this thing. Marianne's dog was also too afraid to come outside. Meanwhile, this object moves away from the road and lands on a hillside about... Uh, 30, 3,400 feet away, just over a half mile. And these occupants start to get out, these men. And they were moving very urgently around underneath this object and appeared to be carrying boxes of what looked like tools. She could see them very clearly. Around this time, the second object reappeared, came swooping down, and landed very close to the first one. And so you've got about uh, five or ten figures here standing under this UFO, 
apparently trying to repair it. And I will just uh, let Marianne describe what she saw in her own words. As Marianne says, they seemed to be dressed in something like a skin diver's wetsuit. It was a dark color and their hands were visible apart or out from the wrist of their suit. Their skin was lighter than the suit they were wearing. They were built like men. The only difference is they were slightly taller, between six and a half feet taller. They seemed to have hair. It seemed well barbered, fairly close to their heads. Uh, they were considering calling the police at this point, but decided not to because they realized that what they were looking at was very unusual. Uh, they could see this was a UFO by the way it was flying. And they decided not to call the police because they did not want authorities to harass the UFO people. Instead, they just watched. And it was very cold outside. So at this point, Marianne went back inside, grabbed her binoculars, and she and her mother watched this object and these men from their window using binoculars. And they watched as these guys moved very urgently, pulling something out of the bottom of this craft and working on it with tools. Uh, they had a very difficult time, apparently. They were moving very quickly, kept trying to put this box-like contraption back into the UFO and couldn't do it. On their third try, they finally did it. But by this point, nearly two ho hours had passed. When they finally got this thing put back together, they picked up all their tools very quickly moving very urgently, running, and all climbed back into these two craft, which took off straight up and zipped away at high speeds. So clearly a very impressive case. The next day, Marianne went up there to see if she could find any evidence and was surprised to see definite landing traces. She saw two separate uh, depressions in the ground that were triangular shaped and more than a foot deep. She also found weird strands of cable, uh, about a foot or two long, some weird kind of paper towel-like cloth, as well as some foil strips. She gathered uh, some of this up, actually, and collected it and brought it back into her, ho her house and put it in a box. Unfortunately, sometime later when she went to retrieve it, she could no longer find it. So this evidence has been lost. Still, this is a very impressive case. Uh, it was researched by very prominent investigators, as I said, and Dwight Connolly included it in his book, World's Best UFO Cases. And he was the for former editor of the MUFON Journal. So he should know what he's talking about. And definitely uh, a very interesting case. And I included it because it, it's a UFO repair case uh, humanoids, a landing, landing traces, multiple witnesses. It's got a lot going for it, and I think deserved to be included on this list. And now we move to case number 12. Case number 12 is the Gary Wilcox encounter. I've discussed this case before, but this is a classic case and definitely deserves to be on this list. It's fairly well known. This occurred on April 24th, 1964 in Tioga City in New York, obviously. Uh, the main witness is dairy farmer Gary T. Wilcox. And he was out in his fields spreading fertilizer when he saw something strange. He at first thought it was a refrigerator or something that somebody had ab abandoned, but it was far too large for that. Then he thought perhaps it was a aircraft engine that had been dropped from a plane. But as he approached it, he could see it clearly wasn't. It was some type of craft, and there were two men standing next to it. Each of them were wearing seamless uniforms with hoods covering their faces, and each of them were carrying a tray of earth, apparently from his field, and carrying it into their craft. The craft itself was egg-shaped and about 20 feet long. So he approaches them and has a conversation with them. Uh, they apparently spoke English. They told him they were from Mars. They actually gave him a prediction that there would be uh, fatality in the astronaut program, which did turn out to be true. 
And they also told him that they were interested in the fertilizer he was spreading in his field. Uh, Gary offered to give them a bag of fertilizer and went back to his barn to go get it. And when he came out back to the location in the field, the craft and the men were gone. Nevertheless, he set down the fertilizer in the field and went back into his working. And when he came back there the next day, the bag of fertilizer was gone. So presumably they took it. Uh, th despite these unusual <laughs> elements, this case uh, did get a lot of research from Jim and Cora Lorenzen, a lot of attention from other researchers, and no one could find any evidence of hoax. As Gary's brother says, uh, if Gary says this thing happened, it really happened. He has nothing to gain and a lot to lose by telling a story like this. I know it is true. And Gary himself spoke about this incident, and I'll just give you a short quote from Gary Wilcox. I don't care whether anyone believes me or not. It doesn't mean anything to me one way or the other. I told them, the police, what I saw and heard. I thought I should. I know what I saw. We talked for two hours, and we were even joking at times. I just don't worry about it. I've got nothing to hide, and if I saw another one today, I would report it. Yeah, a very well-known case, but it definitely deserved a place here. For case number 11, I chose the perfect UFO case. This is what Dr. James McDonald calls this case. Dr. James McDonald was an atmospheric physicist and a pioneering UFO researcher. And he calls this the perfect case for a number of reasons, as we'll find out, but primarily because there were multiple independent witnesses in different locations, as well as radar returns. So this case took place about 15 miles east of Utica on June 23rd, 1955. It began when the co-pilot of a Mohawk DC-3 airliner observed a strange object, oval-shaped, light gray in color, with a line around the perimeter and a row of windows emitting a bright green light. This object appeared about 500 feet above their plane, moving at, quote, great speed. Uh, both the pilot and the co-pilot watched this object move for about several miles until it moved out of view, and they estimate it was moving at about 4,500 miles per hour, uh, much faster than anything we had. So at the same time, nearby radar operators in Boston tracked this object on their radar scopes. And uh, there were other crews in the area who saw this as well. There were two other airliners who also observed this object and reported it over their radio. Air traffic controllers at Albany Airport were monitoring the radio transmissions and they were able to make visual contact. So now we have three separate airliners seeing this object, one very close. We have air traffic controllers at Albany Airport seeing this object, and we have radar controllers in Boston actually tracking this thing on their scopes. So this is an incredible case. It actually made it to the Condon Committee and uh, they were very skeptical of most cases and actually reached a negative conclusion about the UFOs. And yet there, there was this case which they were never able to explain. Dr. Gordon Thayer, the radio propagation specialist, was unable to explain this case at all. And uh, he tried and said it might have been perhaps an anomalous propagation on the radar and just basically ignored the fact that there were so many other independent witnesses. So Dr. James McDonald uh, very much disagreed with Dr. Thayer's report and I'll just quote Dr. McDonald here as he says, this is a most intriguing report that certainly must be classed as an unknown pending further study which it certainly deserves. Statements from some of the other witnesses would help in analyzing the event. 
it does appear that this sighting defies explanation by conventional means. So for Dr. James McDonald, this was the perfect case for three main reasons. One was that there were multiple independent witnesses from separate sources. Second was that these witnesses were both in the air and on the ground. And third was that it had radar com confirmation and that these were all trained observers, people very familiar with aircraft. So he could find no fault in this report and calls it absolutely the perfect case. And I have to agree with him. It's amazing. And that's why I included it here. And now we move to the top 10. For number 10, I chose the landing in Cherry Creek. This is a classic case. Uh, I think it's very well known among UFO investigators, certainly, and has an enormous amount of physical evidence and generated a lot of interest from the Air Force. This occurred on August 19, 1965, at the Butcher Farm in Cherry Creek. Uh, Harold Butcher, age 16, was in the barn getting ready to uh, do some farm work when suddenly he heard this loud noise. Uh, the bull started acting up. Uh, the radio staticked. He looked outside and saw this 50-foot object. It was football-shaped, it was silver, and it landed right in the field. It was making a loud beeping noise. It had a red vapor surrounding it. At this point, the milking machine in the barn suddenly malfunctioned as well. Uh, he grabbed the phone, which was in the barn, and called the house. Uh, meanwhile, back in the house, the radio that they were listening to suddenly went off by itself. They pick up the phone, and it's 16-year-old Harold screaming for everyone to come outside. Uh, by this point, the object was taking off. It made a loud bang and zipped away. Harold hung up the phone, and he saw this object in time to move off. Only one other member of the family uh, actually saw this. 14-year-old Robert ran to the front door and saw this object taking off. Uh, so they called the police. Uh, meanwhile, their neighbor, uh, her name is Kathleen Bruham, she comes knocking on the door and says, it's back, it's here again. So she and uh, all the other butcher family come running outside and they can see this object hovering at about 700 feet overhead. It scoots around for a sh short time and then moves off. By this time, the police arrived, including officers E.J. Haas and P.M. Nelson. They can smell a strange ozone-like odor in the air. Uh, they're impressed by the witnesses. Uh, they decide to contact the Air Force. So at uh, this point, the Air Force sends over people from Project Blue Book. Meanwhile, one of the witnesses, Harold, uh, he finds a strange purple liquid where the object had landed, scoops it up and saves a sample of it. Uh, he find, finds that the bull was so upset by the presence of the object that it actually bent the iron bar that it was tethered to. Uh, so there was some pretty interesting physical evidence right from the outset. Project Blue Book officers arrived and started to investigate. Captain James M. Dorsey from the 4621 Air Force Group interviewed the witnesses and uh, said, I don't think it's a hoax. These children saw something. So Blue Book officers were unable to explain it and actually labeled it unidentified, case number 9806. Uh, as you can see, one of a couple that have been declared un unidentified in Project Blue Book. Uh, interestingly, researcher Dr. James McDonald was shocked by Blue Book's conclusion because they, again, were usually very skeptical in trying to debunk cases. And uh, I'll just quote James McDonald here. I wonder why it happened to be tagged unidentified so quickly. Does this imply that the credibility of all the observers, and especially the Sun Herald, were so high? Or was it the indentations, the singed brush, and the purple liquid? 
or did the bull sell this one by bending the stake with his nose ring? J. Allen Hynek was also surprised by Blue Book's conclusions because uh, they declared it unexplained so quickly. As he says, there was a strong impulse to regard this case as a hoax, but the evidence pointed in the opposite direction. In addition, the witnesses concerned were from a rural family and there seemed to be nothing to be gained by fabricating such a story. As a consequence, Blue Book reluctantly carried this case as unidentified. Uh, apparently they were impressed because according to uh, the investigators who have looked into this case, researchers from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base showed up. There was a whole team from Wright-Patterson who examined the landing traces and found no radiation using a Geiger counter, but did find high levels of phosphorus. That's interesting because that's turned up in other cases. Uh, UFO researcher Robert Galgansky uh, looked into this case and found further confirmation of the event and that there was a cluster of sightings in the days following this incident. Two days following the sighting at the butcher farm, New York troopers Richard Ward and Mr. Purcell saw a UFO just one mile south of the butcher's farm. Uh, NICAP investigators also found another witness who had seen UFOs a few days earlier. A couple of days after the incident, the butcher family saw the UFO again. It appeared to be the same UFO. And the days followed, there were other incidents. Their neighbor, Dick Nelson, reported that he kept hearing a strange beeping noise coming through his television and radio. And uh, later, another group of witnesses said that they were actually chased by this object uh, in their car down the highway. A very impressive case. No one has ever been able to disprove it. And as you see, the Air Force was very interested in it. And that's why I included it. And now we move to number nine. For number nine, I chose the UFO sighting by John Lennon. This is a really uh, influential sighting, I think very well known, but a lot of people don't know the whole story. Uh, it occurred on August 23rd, 1974. John Lennon was with his new girlfriend, May Pang, in their 53rd Street penthouse in the center of Manhattan, New York. Suddenly, May Pang, she saw it first, this classic disc-shaped object, very large, approached to within about just a few hundred feet uh, of their penthouse. They both ran out into the balcony and observed this thing for about uh, 15 minutes, and they said it was about the size of a jet. And as May Pang says, and I'll just quote her directly, as I walked out onto the terrace, my eye caught this large circular object coming towards us. It was shaped like a flattened cone, and on top was a large, brilliant red light, not pulsating as on any of the aircraft we'd seen heading for a landing at Newark Airport. When it came a little closer, we could make out a row or circle of white lights that ran around the entire rim of the craft. These were also flashing on and off. There were so many of these lights that it was dazzling to the mind. Uh, John Lennon didn't really give any interviews about this sighting, but he did once talk about it on the radio. And uh, I'll just quote what he said here, as John Lennon says, I was standing on the roof and I looked left and there was this thing 100 yards away. I could have hit it with a stone if I had a chance. It had all these lights around the bottom of it, flashing on and off. Uh, he tried to take a picture of it with his camera, but the pictures didn't come out. Uh, they later learned that a bunch of people had called the police and also reported it on that day. So it was a pretty major sighting. And uh, Lennon did apparently write about it in one of his songs, uh, Strange Days Indeed. As he says, there's UFOs over New York and I ain't too surprised. Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Strange days indeed. Most peculiar, Mama. Uh, so that's where we thought the story ended for a number of years, but it turned out there was a development. His excellent book, Alien Bedtime Stories, 
Grant Cameron reveals that John Lennon may have had direct contact. Psychic Yuri Geller says that he spoke directly with John Lennon, and that John Lennon revealed that one evening he was in his bedroom when the room lit up and in walked these ant-like creatures, uh, sort of these bug-like creatures. Uh, and uh, these figures actually gave him this metal artifact, a small metal egg. Uh, Yuri Geller has shown this artifact, uh, but it hasn't been scientifically analyzed. At this point, he has refused to let it be analyzed. So that's the case of John Lennon, which I included because I think it's a very important case. It's very interesting because it's another example of a musician being contacted by UFOs. I think their tactic here, the UFOs, is to contact people who are influential in society. So that's why I wanted to include this case. And now we move to number eight. For number eight, I chose the Ryan Neff near collision with a UFO. I think this is well known within the UFO field, but really it should be much more widely known than it is. I'm not sure how many people know about it. It's a very dramatic example of a UFO that nearly collided with a jet, and this jet was actually taken over by the military. Mind you, this is a commercial jet filled with passengers. So how this all began was on April 8, 1956, over Schenectady, New York. There was Captain Raymond Ryan, who was piloting the jet, and William Neff was co-pilot. And there was a large group of passengers as they flew over New York. This was Flight 775. They were flying at about 6,000 feet when suddenly this brilliant white object appeared in front of them on an apparent collision course. They made an emergency turn, and to their shock, this object made a right angle t turn directly towards them and zoomed by at, they estimate, at least 1,000 miles per hour and then disappeared or faded away. So they were freaked out, fearing another collision. Uh, Captain Ryan turned on the landing lights. At this point, the object reappeared again directly in front of them uh, and was pacing their jet. They radioed Griffiths Air Force Base and reported the object. At this point, Griffiths Air Force Base confirmed that they had visual contact and they were going to send two jet fighters after this uh, to vector it in. Stewardess Phyllis Reynolds came into the, co the cockpit room. She saw it as well. And uh, at this point, something really bizarre happened. Griffiths Air Force Base called Pilot Ryan and ordered Flight 775 to pursue the UFO. Ryan and Neff were surprised to find that their passenger jet was now under military orders to pursue this object. Uh, but they agreed, and uh, they deviated course and began to chase after this object. They chased it for about 20 minutes, for about 150 miles, until they reached the point where they were going to be out of radio contact with Gr Griffiths Air Force Base. And there was still no sign of the jets that they had promised to vector in towards this object. So finally, they just disobeyed military orders and returned back onto their course. This was, became a very controversial case. Uh, it was investigated by Major Donald Kehoe, and uh, Kehoe had a lot of problems investigating this case, he said. He said he was stonewalled at every corner and uh, that the Air Force was completely uncooperative. Uh, they, he said they flat out lied about this case. And there was more debunking of this case going on by the military. Uh, one debunker was Donald Menzel, uh, who was now an alleged member, suspected to be an alleged member of the MJ-12 organization as a debunker. At the time, Donald Menzel was a pretty well-known astronomer who was skeptical of UFOs. And uh, according to his report on this case, what the pilots saw was Venus. So that, that's a clearly uh, not a tenable explanation. This is a very controversial case that has 
certainly deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten, and that's why I included it here. And now we move to case number seven. For case seven, I chose The Terror Above Us. This comes from a book by Malcolm Kent by the same name. Uh, this was published in 1967, right on the heels of the Betty and Barney Hill case and the UFO incident by John G. Fuller. So this is a very early reported abduction case and still has a lot of the elements we see in other cases, even up to today. Uh, so that's why I think it's a very important case. And it's not well known. It occurred to two brothers by the name of Jason and Robert. Those are pseudonyms. Uh, it began around the summer of 1958 when these brothers both developed a crippling fear of driving at night. Uh, they began having panic attacks. Uh, one of them just couldn't date anymore, uh, and he was a very avid dater at the time. And one time they were driving along the road when they came upon a bank of fog, and both of them had a crippling panic attack to the point where they had to pull over. They couldn't drive. At this point, they knew something was wrong. Uh, they went to see a therapist, and the therapist had a difficult time uh, finding the origin of their phobia. And he eventually traced it to an incident that had happened while they were driving. They came upon a fog bank, and this is when the whole story started to spill out. Under hypnosis, they came upon a landed UFO in the field, or rather, right in the road in front of them. Uh, it was blocking the road. Uh, short men in dark uniforms showed up. Both men were pulled from the car and moved into the object. Jason found himself undressed, naked, strapped to a table, and being physically examined while Robert found himself in another situation. He found himself in a windowless, metal gray room with a young, attractive woman. And this woman told him that they had been captured by ETs and they wanted, the ETs wanted them to be intimate with each other and that was the only way they would get out. Uh, Robert was having a very difficult time orienting himself. He could not figure out where he you know, what had just happened, where he had just been, or where he was, and he didn't trust this woman who was making uh, intimate advances towards him. Uh, he said she smelled bad, had a really strange odor, and he suspected, actually, that she was one of the ETs in disguise. Uh, he blacked out, and when he woke up, he had been undressed, and he was lying next to this woman uh, who was also undressed, so here we have that theme of reproduction, which we see in other cases. And again, this is all covered under hypnosis. So moving back to uh, Jason, after he was physically examined, he blacked out, and then he woke up and went through the same experience that his brother had reported, where this woman tried to make uh, advances at him. And... Uh, which he accepted. He felt like he had no choice. Next thing they know, both brothers found themselves sitting next to each other on a very low bench. Their hands were bound in front of them with some sort of weird strap. They were paralyzed and unable to move while this weird hypnotic device came down from the ceiling and uh, hypnotized them. Next thing they know, they wake up at home uh, in their car a full day has passed and they have no memory of what happened other than they thought that they got stuck at work. So, and under hypnosis, this is what the hypnotic command was. To, you, know, you won't remember, you will not remember this, you just had problems at work. So that's all they were left with. And after, after the incident, these phobias really ramped up and became crippling and that's when they sought therapy. It, it took six years and that's the story that came out. I find it very interesting because it echoes the sort of accounts we see today. Uh, Malcolm Kent is the sole researcher to this story, and I'll just quote him directly. As Malcolm Kent says, Until the strange story of Jason and Robert was revealed to me, and for a long while afterward, I did not believe in what are called flying saucers. I believe that Jason and Robert, while driving home late one fog-infested night, were kidnapped by alien creatures 
and taken aboard an alien ship where strange and revealing experiments were made upon their body. These are the facts. I'm going to present them, stand behind them, claim in front of my peers and my God that I believe them. There are those I know, and the numbers include almost everyone interested in flying saucers, that believe we can learn untold secrets, open amazing doors of learning, not just in science, but in philosophy, psychology, medicine. For these reasons and others, people attempt to track down the saucers and the saucer people, berate the government for denying their existence, make speeches and write books. I'd like to suggest that this course is as mad as those disputed previously. It is only too clear that the aliens are not interested in telling us or teaching us anything. And what, and what could we learn from them if they were willing to tell us their secrets? If the aliens treat us with impunity, assuming the right to sweep down out of the skies and kidnap us, and close us with creatures of their manufacture, stick needles into our skin, and watch us reproduce, what makes us think that whatever philosophy they have will be superior to our own? So Malcolm Kent takes a pretty dim view of this whole experience. Uh, I don't think uh, he can be faulted for that. This is a very early reported abduction, and it does have a lot of pretty alarming elements to it, for sure. Uh, but I think a very important case, and that's why I included it. And now we move to case number six. For number six, I chose the Maurice Bay UFO crash retrieval incident. This is a very controversial incident. It was investigated by the Long Island UFO Network, which was headed by researcher John Ford, uh, who himself has had some controversy. But it appears that the event is legitimate. Uh, this occurred on September 28th, 1989. And as the story goes, a UFO was shot down by the military. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just going to report uh, the facts that we know about this incident, at least as they were reported by the Long Island UFO Reporting Network and other researchers. Again, this occurred on September 28th, 1989. There had been a wave of sightings prior but on September 28th at about 5.30 p.m., Mary McLaughlin and her son saw two large triangular objects in this area. A half hour later, residents in the area said they saw military arriving and started setting up roadblocks along the East uh, Maurice Coast Guard base. Or at 8 p.m., Mona Rowe, uh, who, a resident of the area saw amber lights in the sky and she thought at first they were flares, but they didn't quite look right. Uh, another resident, Miss P.G., and her son saw strange lights in the sky uh, and looking at them saw that they were actually attached to a huge triangular shaped object. Another witness interviewed by the Long Island UFO Network was Larry S. and his son who were out fishing along Maurice Harbor when they saw these helicopters and what they first thought were flares, uh, but they're not sure they were flares. These were orange kind of amber objects, and uh, they watched this for several hours. They stayed there until 1 p.m. and uh, were very nervous about what they were seeing because it was clearly unusual. Another witness by the name of Susan was near Southampton College when she saw eight lights. They looked like they were about 500 feet over the highway, uh, this was on Tukahoe Lane. Uh, so there's a lot of witnesses here. 8.15, a dentist by the name of John Sykes was driving along Sunrise in the nearby uh, town of Quag when he saw these strange lights, and he's definitely convinced this was not a flare. Another interviewed witness is Paul Peterson, who described seeing six amber lights. Uh, also, he saw several helicopters heading towards them. Uh, he went out with his friend to investigate, and they saw these lights hovering about 50 feet over the water, and they stayed for about two hours in place, and they, they were taking pictures. Uh, Bob Eschler, who is a MUFON investigator, actually was able to examine these photographs and believes they're genuine, and says they were not flares because there's no heat signature apparent in them. So the evidence for this is definitely building up at 9 p.m., 
Another witness, Carol Olivieri, and her husband Frank said that they saw these strange lights and helicopters. 9.30 p.m., Kevin and Kathy O'Donnelly saw these lights uh, while they were driving. They said it actually paced their car at treetop level and lit up the area around them bright as daylight. It was totally silent. Uh, they got to their home, and this object hovered over a nearby field, which is about a 10-acre field, and they said it covered it completely. Some, another witness was a court officer by the name of Frank, uh, who saw what he thought were flares and an AFC-130 dropping people, uh, parachutists, into the water. Uh, so definitely there's some sort of operation going on that involves at least the military. At 2.30 a.m., a commodities broker by the name of John and his sister were woken up by helicopters and uh, looked outside of their home. And to their shock, there was helicopters flying by and hanging from it was a very large circular object being carted away. Uh, so at this point, numerous other witnesses were seen a military convoy moving along the roads from Smith's Point Beach along the William Floyd Parkway towards Brookhaven Labs. So the Long Island UFO Network uh, took a while to collect all these reports and sort of build this case for the possible existence of a UFO crash retrieval which took place uh, on Maurice Harbor. But according to some researchers, this thing wasn't just a crash, it was actually shot down. Uh, one researcher is UFO researcher George Dixon, who was told by an inside source, a colonel who worked at the Pentagon, that the military actually shot down this UFO using Star Wars weapons. And according to this colonel, the UFO retaliated and actually struck back with sort of a sound weapon, a, a sonic weapon, which killed 18 people, including a small group of psychics who had been brought by the military to communicate telepathically with the alleged ETs. So this case starts to get you know, really towards the fringe here, uh, with a lot of bizarre but interesting information, certainly. Uh, and it does appear to have legitimacy to it, because the Long Island UFO Network held a press conference, and the Copley News Service received confirmation of activity in this area from both the police and the Coast Guard though they made later inquiries which resulted in nothing but complete blanket denials. So once again, we have officials backtracking. Uh, various explanations were raised to try and debunk this case from officials, including reports of a Russian satellite. Others said it was a drug bust. Another source said it was the, an air-sea training operation. So we start to get contradictory debunking explanations. That's a pattern we see again in uh, high-level cases. So it's very hard to say what exactly happened here, uh, but researcher George Dixon said he found another witness who was actually on the scene and worked on the weapon itself. He was just there for a, sh a short portion uh, when they actually shot down this object, but uh, says that it's absolutely legitimate and he refused to elaborate any more because he was being threatened. And there's a weird and kind of complex, interesting end note to the Maurice Bay uh, UFO crash. On July 17, 1996, that's you know, many years later, TWA Flight 800 was flying over Maurice Harbor. They had been 12 minutes in the air, had just reached 14,000 feet when they spontaneously exploded. Uh, 230 people perished. There were no survivors. Uh, there was a lot of speculation that this might have been a missile at first because a bunch of people saw a huge flash of light uh, heading towards this object. In fact, there were over 50 witnesses who reported this. Uh, Michael Russo said he saw a glint, quick and sharp. I wish I hadn't seen it. Uh, Actually, there was another person, Linda Cabot, who managed to photograph what appears to be a missile or something heading towards, the, uh, well, certainly in the air at the time of this incident. 
Uh, Major Fred Meyer, he witnessed this flash of light, and he was inside a military National Guard helicopter at the time, and he says, I saw what I've described as a light in the sky that has the characteristic and trajectory of a shooting star. The difference was this was broad daylight, and I was immediately curious because I've never seen anything like that in broad daylight. I've seen missiles fired at me, SAM 1s, 2s, 7s. Their 1960s Vietnam vintage missiles is the last time anybody shot at me. I do not attribute or ascribe to this any of the characteristics of those missiles. I've seen missiles. Nothing in my experience says missiles. So this was not just, you know, a conspiracy. This was being taken seriously by major news outlets. In fact, Aviation Week and Technology, the New York Times and Newsweek all printed articles uh, speculating on the possibility that, that the plane had come down from some tor- type of friendly fire. This even appeared on Larry King Live. And uh, there was, of course, the report from United Airlines pilot Richard Russell of Daytona, Florida, who said flat out, TWA Flight 800 was shot down by a U.S. Navy guided missile ship and said he was given this information by a high-level briefing. Of course, the military has denied this. Uh, There's been a lot of research into this incident. It was a tragic accident. In 1997, the Discovery Channel did a special on Flight 800 and revealed that there had been a number of Navy ships offshore uh, when this happened, offshore of Long Island. And they were conducting top secret maneuvers at the time, including, quote, satellite reconnaissance. Hard to say, but there's a lot of controversy surrounding this incident. Uh, There's been a lot of research into it. I don't want to get too deep into it. Uh, but I would like to quote a little uh, snippet from researcher Elaine Douglas, who is, I think, a prominent and well-respected researcher. As Elaine Douglas says, there's that curious coincidence about Maurice Bay, which more than a few persons have pointed out is where John Ford said that the U.S. brought down an alien craft in 1989. And Maurice Bay is where TWA Flight 800 mysteriously crashed. The cause of that crash, readers are aware, has so far eluded federal investigators, and in particular, investigators are unable to explain the reports of more than 20 persons who say they saw an unaccountable light streaking towards Flight 800 before it went down. So this is developing into a huge conspiracy, and uh, certainly one who is knowledgeable about conspiracies is author Peter Moon, who wrote about the Montauk Project. Uh, Peter Moon of the Montauk Project says that Flight 800 was in fact shot down by friendly fire using Star Wars technology. As he says, the rumor in my circle has it that it was the particle accelerator at Brookhaven Labs on the Montauk Point, part of the Strategic Defense Initiative program. The plane was passing in the vicinity of a military exercise when a heat-generated target was being pursued, but something malfunctioned, and the beam was accidentally fired up from the ground, hitting the deactivated missile and activating it, the heat-seeking missile passed through the hull of the plane, destroying it and leaving no trace of itself. Uh, So that's what Peter Moon says. Uh, There was a lot of controversy surrounding what brought this plane down. They did think it might be a missile. 300 FBI investigators converged on this scene, as well as air traffic investigators. They eventually concluded that it had uh, occurred because of a spark in the central fuel tank. Uh, But some people to this day disagree with it. Whether it was friendly fire or a UFO, uh, it's still hard to say. But what's very interesting is there's some very bizarre incidents that a lot of people don't know about. And this is why I wanted to include this after note on uh, this whole Maurice Harbor case, uh, because a lot of UFOs have been seen in this exact area by other jets. Uh, On November of 1996, just a few months following this incident, the crew of a Pakistani jet were flying over the same spot when, according to FBI investigator Rob Rapalski, 
I'm interpreting it as they saw a single beam or a point of light enough to attract their attention. One month later, there was another strange UFO seen about at about 12,000 feet over JFK, very close to where uh, the TWA Flight 800 had crashed. This was a Saudi Arabian 747, and they described seeing a green flare-like object which hung over their plane for a short period of time, but long enough to be caught on radar. And their, as a result of this sighting, their flight was actually diverted to Dole's airport where federal officials questioned them about what they saw. Uh, airport officials released a statement about the incident saying, it might turn out to be completely nothing. I can't say there is anything to it. Obviously, if someone reports something, they have to check it out. That's standard. And uh, later, CNN was told by the FBI that it could have been a meteor shower, uh, which clearly it couldn't have been if it's hovering over their plane for a period of time and appearing on radar. And in August 9th, 1997, just again, you know, not far later, there was a fourth incident in which a 747 was involved. This appeared in the Toronto Sun and involved Swiss Air Flight 127, which was cru cruising over New York at 23,000 feet, just opposite of John F. Kennedy Airport, uh, quote, according to the Toronto Sun, near the area where TWA Flight 800 went down in July of 1996. And uh, the pilot was addressing passengers on another issue when he cut his transmission off to call the National Transportation Board when this object came shooting by them. He called it a near miss by a round white object. And according to the NTSB, the following conversation occurred between air traffic controllers in Boston and the pilot of Swiss Air 747 Jumbo Jet. The object had just streaked past the plane when Swiss Air radioed in. Swiss Air. Sir, I don't know what it was, but it just flew like a couple of hundred feet above us. I don't know if it was a rocket or whatever, but incredibly fast in the opposite direction. The controller asked, in the opposite direction? Swiss Air. Yes, sir. It was too fast to be an airplane. At this point, the controller located another aircraft in the area and asked the crew if they saw anything like a missile in the area. The response was negative. And uh, the controller asked Swiss Air how close the object was to his plane. And the controller replied, it was right over us, right above, opposite direction, and I don't know, two, three, four hundred feet above. We saw a light object. It was white and very fast. So lots of strange events surrounding this whole incident. Uh, as one researcher, John Romero, wrote in his article, just as UFOs enter the Flight 800 mystery, the case is closed, he points out that as soon as this whole UFO connection became undeniable, federal investigators immediately came up with the cause of the crash. Z writes, the diagnosis effectively bumped the mystery of Flight 800 out of the news, but the explanation was curiously timed. It came just as reliable witnesses had reported a possible UFO connection to the explosion and crash that killed 230 passengers and crew on the Paris-bound 747. So this is a very long and complex case, and I just want to close it with a poignant end note, uh, which is really interesting and ties into all this. This comes from English researcher Tony Dodd, who was interviewing an abductee by the name of Stephen. And Stephen had been taken on board a UFO, and he was often given messages, sometimes of future events. And on one occasion, he was given a very strange pro prophecy, uh, just a, a few weeks before the crash of uh, this plane. As uh, Tony Dodd writes, on one occasion, Stephen saw an airliner crash. He asked the aliens if they could stop this from happening and was told no. Two weeks later, TWA Flight 800 crashed into the sea off Long Island. Uh, so that's case uh, number six, which I know got a bit long there. Uh, but 
I think deserves to be told. Something clearly happened in Maurice Harbor and is still happening if all these airliners are seeing this strange activity. All right, now we get to the top five. For number five, I chose Pine Bush, UFO hotspot. Pine Bush is an area in upstate New York, which for a very long time has had a reputation for attracting UFOs in very large numbers. The activity goes back decades, but in 1980 really ramped up and sort of became famous. Uh, it's a very interesting area. It's pretty rural. According to air traffic controller at Stewart International, he revealed to UFO investigators that this area is what they call a border area and is actually not uh, visible on radar. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why it's so active. It became famous, as I said, in 1980, largely through the work of Harry Liebelson and Ellen Crystal. Ellen Crystal had seen a UFO and uh, was very interested in UFOs and contacted Omni Magazine, uh, where Harry Liebelson worked, and asked him about UFOs. And Harry Liebelson had heard about sightings in the Pine Bush area and told her that would be a good place to start. And this is how Ellen Crystal became actually a pretty prominent UFO researcher. And Harry Liebelson joined her as they began investigating the UFO sightings at Pine Bush. They interviewed a number of residents, including policemen, the barber, store clerks, a bunch of blue collar workers, all who said that there's been activity there a long time since about the late 1960s. Uh, interestingly, this is not far from Crawford, where Whitley Strieber had his cabin. So Ellen Crystal started going out there to see if she could see UFOs, and she did almost immediately. She began photographing them. She visited this area on a weekly basis uh, and uh, started getting some very close-up sightings. Sometimes she's getting close as 50 feet, and uh, she's decided that she's going to have to start bringing more witnesses in because there's a lot of activity going on in this area. Uh, she researched it a little bit, found out there's mining in this area. So something was very strange was going on in the Pine Bush area. And Ellen Crystal was determined to figure out what it was. In 1986, she was researching there again and said this object approached to within 30 feet away and hovered about 8 feet over her car. She started bringing carloads of people in to watch these objects and was having incredible success. The number of witnesses was growing rapidly and this area was becoming well known as a place you could go to to see UFOs. Uh, probably Ellen Crystal's closest encounters was when she saw a gray actually run across the road in front of her car. She caught it in her flashlight. Uh, so she continued to do research and uh, brought more people in. She brought in Robert Toto, a MUFON investigator, and they had a number of sightings. She brought in other witnesses such as Rich Rohrman, Edward Moray, Arlene Clifford, uh, other witnesses, Renee Petrella, David D'Elia. Uh, she eventually wrote a book about her experiences here in Pine Bush called Silent Invasion, and I think is largely responsible for popularizing it and making this small community a uh, what amounts to is a tourist attraction bringing in hundreds of people to see UFOs. And one of them was uh, Vinnie Pelise. Uh, in 1991, his brother had seen a UFO and Pelise was very intrigued. So they went out and started researching the Pine Bush area and were incredibly successful, had a number of close-up sightings. And uh, at one point, Vinnie Pelise also describes a face-to-face contact with a humanoid. So this was the place to go <laughs> to see UFOs. Vinnie Police ended up writing a book about uh, his encounters in Pine Bush, which he called the Pine Bush Phenomenon. And by 1995, it got out of control. Uh, at this point, there were cars lined up nightly along this one road. It's called West Searsville Road. That became the place to uh, see UFOs in this area, and hundreds of cars would line up along this road to view UFOs. 
Researcher Linda Zimmerman has written about cases in pine bush. That's very well known. Uh, but it was causing problems. By uh, 1997, there were property developers in the area who were dismayed by the crowds of hundreds of onlookers and contacted the police. A whole controversy fo followed. Ultimately, there was a no loitering order put out and people were forbidden from parking along Searsville Road. Uh, so <laughs> it sort of put the pine bush phenomena to a little bit of an end, but you can't kill a good thing, and, and the UFOs are still appearing. Uh, pe people are going to come and look at them. And to this day, Pine Bush remains uh, one of the most famous areas to see a UFO. There, in 2003, they started holding UFO meetings. And to this day, there's an annual uh, Pine Bush Festival. So it's become sort of an iconic uh, UFO sighting area. And that's why in I included it, and that's why I gave it the number five place. Now we move to number four, and these are the encounters of Whitley Strieber. I think this definitely deserves its uh, ranking as number four. Uh, Whitley Strieber's encounters have had a huge impact on the field. Uh, the whole ins story unfolded really beginning in July of 1984. Willie Strieber was a novelist at the time, famous for novels like The, the Hunger and Wolfen. And uh, one evening in July of 1984, uh, he was in his cabin in Crawford, New York, when he heard the footsteps and the motion sensor light went off. And he looked outside, there was nothing there. Uh, next year, on October 4th, 1985, in the middle of the night, he was in his cabin when the entire interior lit up with light. His wife Anne saw it. His son saw it. Their two friends downstairs thought the light was so bright that it was morning. And uh, the light flashed out and everyone was very much confused by the incident. That morning Strieber had flashbacks of a UFO hovering over the house. And his son told him that little people had come running in and said everything was going to be okay. But otherwise, nobody seemed to talk about it. Then on December 26th, 1985, everything changed when Whitley woke up to hear people downstairs in his living room. And uh, he woke up the next morning and not feeling well. He had a very restless night. He was feeling anxious, had fatigue, he was feeling fluish. He had memories of a large owl staring at him through the window. He had tactile memories of being pushed and poked at and seemed to remember a light in the woods. But it was all a confused jumble and he wasn't sure what to make of it. And it was one week later when he was skiing when he had a pain in his head and discovered a needle mark. And suddenly this flood of memories came rushing back. He recalled being pulled from his room carried by gray ki or uh, these sort of bluish skinned creatures into the woods. There was a gray next to him. He was sucked up into a craft and uh, underwent a fairly unpleasant examination, uh, including an anal probe. He got a lot of ribbing for that, but uh, I really commend him for coming forward and describing it. Uh, he uh, thought it was a very scary experience uh, and uh, had no memory of it until uh, this suddenly, spontaneously popped into his head. I uh, he thought he was going crazy, maybe having a psychotic break. So he went to the doctor, the physical doctor pronounced him healthy. He went to a psychologist and the psychologist pronounced him healthy. Uh, he did eventually take some imagery and found evidence of what appears to be implants in his body. Uh, so uh, at this point he started to realize <laughs> what was happening to him and uh, that he was having UFO experiences. After these memories flooded into his head, Strieber thought he was going crazy. He went to the physical doctor who pronounced him healthy. He went to a psychiatrist who could find nothing wrong with him. Uh, he, but these memories were flooding into his head and uh, it took him a little bit to piece it together, but he realized it was the UFO phenomenon. Uh, he recalled seeing 
a UFO hovering over his house. So it was started to become clear to him that whatever this was, it was something to do with UFOs. And uh, he began researching it. He looked into his childhood, found out he had a history of encounters that he had kind of denied or suppressed or explained away, including a UFO sighting with his little sister. He had a memory of being abducted from a train with his father and seeing dozens of soldiers. Uh, he had other strange memories as well. Remembered being at his grandma's house as a kid. He was reading a book when this ant-like figure, very short, appeared next to him and had a metal rod in its hand. So he started to have all these memories coming back to him and uh, decided he was going to seek hypnotherapy, which he did, and found out that he was, in fact, a UFO abductee. Uh, the, Uf the ETs told him, you are our chosen one. Uh, that was a phrase he did not find convincing. Uh, but uh, started having a lot of unusual experiences after this. Uh, he moved to the New York City uh, in partly in an attempt to avoid having contact, but the contact just followed him. In 1977, he remembered a weird experience where people were talking through his stereo. His wife was there. They said something like, we know something else about you. Uh, and this is when the experiences just continued. They moved to New York and lived on 76th Street where they had another weird incident which he could never quite explain, thought it was a burglar in his house. Uh, they moved away from there to the East 75th Street and lived on the 33rd floor. Um, still the ETs arrived. His son reported seeing figures. Uh, at one point the babysitter did. They started to freak out. They ended up moving from that they moved to the Upper West Side in 1983. And in his apartment there, he had three hours of missing time. On October of 1984, he drove into a fog bank, had more missing time. So at this point, he's still unconscious of being a UFO abductee. It wasn't until his experiences at his cabin in 1986 that he realized that this was involved with the UFO phenomena. Uh, he wasn't crazy. In fact, there were implants in his body which showed under uh, x-rays and MRIs and he eventually sought hypnotherapy and uncovered uh, what had happened on some of these events of missing time, usually of which was examinations. And the experiences just ramped up following that. Uh, he had been unconscious of being an abductee but he started having fully conscious encounters. Uh, in 1986, the ETs showed up in his room wearing what appeared to be a double-breasted suit. Uh, he thought it might be to reduce the fear factor, which other uh, contactees have also reported. It didn't work in his case. He still thought it was very scary. Uh, he ended up writing the book Communion about his experiences. And uh, as he sent it out to various publishers, or rather his agent did, all of them rejected it. He couldn't find anybody to pick it up. And finally, after a long list, Morrow Books agreed to publish the book and actually gave Whitley Strieber an advance of $1 million. They believed in the book, and as it turned out, they were right. The publication of Communion went off like an atom bomb. Whitley Strieber was the first real celebrity to come forward claiming to have been abducted by aliens, and uh, the book was a phenomenal uh, success. It reached number one on the New York Times. It broke publishing records. It stayed in the top 10 for over a year and, and is, I believe, the most successful UFO book published and uh, really just introduced the world to the idea of UFO abductions. Whitley Strieber became more known for his UFO experiences rather than his fiction and uh, sort of transitioned into the UFO field and uh, began writing more books. He eventually wrote a series of books about his encounters. Uh, he became very well known, appeared on television and radio, received 20 letters daily, and uh, introduced a lot of people to actually seeing UFOs. In 1986, uh, astronomer John Gleedman visited Whitley Strieber at his cabin and actually witnessed UFOs firsthand. 
Another person who had an experience at Whitley's cabin was director Philip Mora. And uh, he was staying at the cabin when he saw a bright light fill the room and had a dreamlike visitation with a gray ET. Another person who had an encounter as a result of Whitley's sort of contagion uh, was the editor of Communion, actually. The editor's name was Bruce Lee, and in February of 1987, Bruce Lee went to visit the Walmrath's bookstore on Lexington Avenue to see the display and came upon two strange figures standing in front of the book display, who he said were all wrapped up in scarves and sunglasses and gloves and were speed reading the book saying, oh, this part is right, this part is wrong, and so on. And he approached them and saw that they weren't human. He said their eyes were far too large. They gave him a very angry stare. Their, their skin was very pale. It scared the daylights out of him, and he stumbled away and got out of there. It's a very strange encounter, but one of several which have taken place uh, actually in public areas in New York. Uh, so that's just one of them. So the whole Whitley Strieber case is just multiplies. It's much larger. Uh, in February, or let's see, in uh, 1988, Whitley Strieber started working on the film Com Communion, telling the version of his story. And more people saw UFOs at his house. Uh, Raven Dana and Lori Barnes were two people who were staying at his house and both had a first-hand encounter with a gray ET. They both said it was benevolent. Uh, in uh, Also, another person who had an encounter was Michael Talbot, an author and friend of Whitley Strieber. And uh, he visited the cabin and had a lucid dream type experience where he saw what he thought was a bag lady, sort of a gray dressed up as a bag lady on the front doorstep. And they proceeded to have a conversation. And he told Whitley Strieber about it the next morning. And Whitley Strieber was shocked because he had seen the whole thing. He'd woken up because he heard noise and came down the stairs and stopped when he saw the gray at the front door and Michael Talbot talking to it. So it wasn't a dream at all. So an incredible case. Journalist Ed Conroy decided to look into it to see if it was a hoax, and he came away utterly convinced. And not only that, he himself started having experiences. So this is something that Whitley Strieber has an effect on people. Uh, he continues to have encounters. He's had a lot of poltergeist phenomena, out-of-body experiences, precognition. He had an episode of levitation. The ETs have given him various messages. Uh, they told him they could control his finances and gave him a demonstration of that. They told him he had to stop eating sweets, uh, which he did. Uh, he slowly got over the whole fear factor, to a large extent at least, and started to sort of build a relationship uh, with these guys. He had an ET once jump on his back. Uh, he started seeing these guys in his house at night, sometimes on a nightly basis. And little by little, uh, he had sort of a more interactive relationship. One of his most profound experiences uh, was when he saw an ET come and approached him and put its little hand in his. And uh, so it's still a scary experience, I think, for him, uh, but definitely has also become very spiritual. And let me just give you a little quote from him about that experience he had with this ET putting his hand in his. As Strieber says, I kept working and meditating with him. It was a wonderful, incredible period in my life, and I wish dearly that I could share him with every single soul in the world. My hope is that contact will lead to friendships like this for everybody who seeks them. I sought myself to free myself, as he was free. I was fascinated with his physical abilities. I'd seen him disappear. He levitated at will. When he left, he'd shoot through the wall. I loved him. I had never loved anybody else like this. I didn't know his name. I rarely saw him. I'd never heard him speak. But he knew me vastly better than anybody else ever had. He was a teacher, a real one, not the sort of egocentric fake that usually treads the path of enlightenment. By any human standard, he was totally enlightened. 
So these are the encounters of Whitley Strieber. And as I said, he's written a number of best-selling books about this and continues to uh, dominate the Amazon UFO bestseller list. Uh, he's had a very profound effect on this field. I've talked to him several times. He's a wonderful guy. And uh, I'm really glad he's come forward because he's had a very strong effect on this field. And that's why I wanted to include him as the number four case on my list. And now we move to the top three. For number three, I chose the Brooklyn Bridge Abduction. This was a case researched by Bud Hopkins. Uh, how it came to light is very interesting. There was a lady by the name of Linda Napolitano. Uh, she at first uh, was, was anonymous, but she had had a lifetime of encounters and was starting to put things together. In the late 1980s, she went to the doctor and discovered a weird object in her sinus and uh, realized she was probably having encounters with ETs. So after doing some research, she contacted Bud Hopkins and became one of his clients and started working with him using hypnotherapy to recall what happened. And uh, then this weird incident happened. This was on November 30th, 1989. Linda was in her apartment, which overlooks the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's a high-rise apartment. Suddenly she wakes up. The room's filled with light. There's three ETs in her room, grays. They grab her and pull her out of her apartment through the window and into this object. Uh, next thing she knows, she's being put back in bed. Uh, it was a very frightening thing for her. She didn't remember anything else, but she immediately called Bud Hopkins. Uh, she, they scheduled an appointment for hypnosis, and under hypnosis she recalled being physically examined, and uh, there were other parts she wasn't able to recall, so they later scheduled uh, more hypnosis sessions. Meanwhile, Bud Hopkins received a letter from a gentleman who wanted to remain anonymous, who said he was a security guard. Um, actually, there were two security guards who said that they were gu guarding a highly placed world official, and they told Bud Hopkins that they had viewed the entire incident, that they were parked below the Brooklyn Bridge and saw a woman being pulled from her apartment and uh, into this object. And they described exactly what Linda herself had reported. And uh, this was just the first uh, witness to come forward. Other witnesses over the next few months started to come forward. In fact, Bud Hopkins heard from more than a dozen witnesses who reported seeing Linda be pulled out of her apartment. This is... Uh, very unusual. This is definitely an outlier. Most abduction cases are not observed, but this one was ob observed by numerous people from different locations. As Bud Hopkins says, over the past five years, I have interviewed and communicated with nearly a score of individuals involved in this New York City abduction case. After conducting many hypnotic regressions and studying the various types of physical evidence, I have come to a firm conclusion. This abduction event so drastically alters our knowledge of the alien incursion in our world that it is easily the most important in recorded history. No previous case has had such profound effect on so many lives, and none has ever been observed by so many independent witnesses. Among the many stunned observers was a political figure of international significance whose presence was likely reason for this demonstration of alien capability. So clearly an unusual event at the very least, if not you know, the most important, as Bud Hopkins says. At any rate, he did produce the testimonies of a number of these witnesses. One was Janet, who was actually on the Brooklyn Bridge at the time, and says her car was stalled, as well as all the cars around her. Uh, she saw this object hovering over the building, or next to the building, and Linda being pulled out. Some people thought it might be a mannequin in a movie. Others were screaming, she said, in uh, horror and terror. It was very frightening for some of them. And uh, many other witnesses saw this. One was Brooklyn resident Kathy Turner, who s described the object as fiery red. That was the description mas matched by most witnesses. Her neighbor Francesca also observed the event. Uh, meanwhile, Dan... Uh, 
And meanwhile, Bud Hopkins received more letters from the security guards guarding the world leader, and they told him they had memories of being on board the UFO or standing on the beach with Linda and the ETs. Uh, at this point, Linda was having further hypnotic regressions, and sure enough, she recalled seeing both the security guards and the world leader. Uh, she also got messages from the ETs. The ETs wanted to give warnings, apparently, to these people about pollution and uh, polluting our planet was basically the main message, destroying our environment. Meanwhile, other witnesses came forth. There was a lady by the name of Erica who told Hopkins that she was abducted on that day or that evening. ETs came in and floated her from her room into this large par parking lot. She saw the big fiery red UFO not far away uh, over the Brooklyn Bridge. And she says that she was floated over to a, uh, this field, this parking lot, along with about 20 other people. So this appears to be a mass abduction. Hard to say, but it's definitely a very complicated event. Bud Hopkins tells the story of this in his book, Witnessed. It's a 400-page book. It's an uh, excellent book, actually. I highly recommend it. It's a very complicated case. The world leader told Hopkins that he would never, ever come forward, and he never did. But apparently, we do now know who it was. According to researcher Stephen Greer, it was the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Perez de Cuellar. But Dr. Stephen Greer has a very different take on this whole event. Uh, according to Stephen Greer, de Cuellar was about to go public with the UFO phenomena, along with a number of other world leaders, and make a public announcement about UFOs. And instead, to stop this from happening, apparently, the government set, stepped in and staged a UFO event, uh, which wasn't aliens at all. According to Stephen Greer, it was psychotronic weapons. As Greer writes, the goal of the operation was to stop this entire attempt by the world power elites, including Gorbachev, to disclose the truth to the world. These abduction events are paramilitary paramilitary operations run by humans using things that look like UFOs and even having creatures on board that look like extraterrestrials but are disguised humans or man-made creatures. I'm not sure that explains what's going on here. Uh, that's Stephen Greer's take on it. Uh, I, think the I don't think abductions <laughs> are all my labs as he's asserting that this one was. And Bud Hopkins certainly does not believe this theory either. At any rate, that's the Brooklyn Bridge abduction case. I think it is an important case. Uh, and that's why I gave it the number three spot. And now we move for number two. The spot for number two I gave to the Hudson Valley UFO wave. This occurred from about 1982 to 1984 is considered one of the most widely viewed UFO events in history. That's definitely a top 10 <laughs> event in terms of sightings of what occurred. It was a huge, huge wave. It really ramped up uh, around 1983. Uh, the main investigator was Philip Imbrogno. He's one of actually many investigators who've looked into this. Imbrogno was a member of MUFON and QFOS when he interviewed a police officer from Kent who saw this boomerang-shaped UFO. This was right on uh, December 31st, 1982. And more sightings started to come in following this. There was a sighting on February 26, 1983 by Monique Driscoll. She saw a boomerang-shaped object hovering over White Pone Lake in Kent. On March 17, 1983, the Sheriff's Office in Brewster, New York, received a flood of calls of people reporting an object over the highway. Uh, some of the witnesses were Fred Dennis, Sheila Sabo, Chris Clark, George Lesnick. Uh, all these people saw this object hovering over Interstate 84. Linda Nicolette saw this 
object from her house hovering over the highway. Dennis Sant saw this object. She says it was 50 feet over his house. William Durkin was driving along inter Interstate 84. He pulled over with about a dozen other people uh, and watched this huge boomerang-shaped object move at a very slow pace at a very low level over the highway. It was stopping traffic all along the highway, and people were jumping out of their homes and watching this as it just moved overhead. Uh, so this was a huge event. And it was only a short time later that there was an even bigger event. The real big event was on March 24th, 1983. This was when the Yorktown police station received a flood of calls. In fact, there was calls coming in all over the place. And Brogno looked into that case and discovered that multiple counties, their police stations were being flooded, including police stations in 15 communities in Westchester and Putnam counties. So he set up a hotline and uh, in the first day received more than 100 calls. So there was clearly a, an enormous wave of epic proportions going on. As Imbrogno says, just how many people actually saw this large boomerang-shaped object as it drifted over the valley during a two and a half hour period that evening will probably never be known, but it is likely that several thousand people saw this strange phenomena that night. There were so many reports that an that investigators had to ignore the routine sightings in order to concentrate on those involved with close encounters or when the object came to within 500 feet of the witnesses. 85% of all the sightings reported that night came from the area of Westchester and Putnam counties, only three miles wide and 12 miles long. The Taconic Parkway runs through the center of this area, and the object appeared to have been meandering back and forth across that roadway. Some of the witnesses to this event include Hunt Middleton. He saw the object near his home in Bedford. Steve Whittles and his friends saw the object from their home in Carmel. Lawrence Greeman and his family, also in Carmel, saw this object sending down beams of light. Joan Lindauer said it followed her down the road in Millwood. Ed Burns was on the highway when he pulled over and watched it with dozens of other people who pulled over. A police officer by the name of Kevin Soravia, he was on patrol and saw this object. So many witnesses. Bill Hell pulled over and saw this object hovering at so many witnesses. Bill Heal saw this object and was hovering about 1,000 feet over the highway and moving at only a few miles per hour. Dennis Fleming saw people weaving on the highway and screeching to a stop and pulling over. He pulled over and they all stopped and watched this giant boomerang shot object <laughs> move over the highway. This was an incredible, incredible sight. David Scarpino saw this object hovering over Ossining Reservoir at treetop level. He said it was bigger than a 747. The Holtzman family was driving along 301 when they saw this object. John Miller of Brewster saw it. Dozens of people were in a restaurant in Stormville. They saw this object. So the number of witnesses is too many to count, too many to list. There was another police officer who saw it. So it was just an incredible, incredible night, March 24th. Whatever happened on that night, a lot of people saw it. And the sightings continued. Around this time... There was another phenomenon. Ultralight planes started to be seen, groups of them, flying at very low levels, sometimes strung up with Christmas lights, colored lights. This appears to be an attempt to confuse the issue. This is what certainly Philip Imbrogno believes. He, this is what he found out and was told actually by an inside source. But it definitely confused the issue and a lot of people reported seeing these ultralights and thought it was a UFO while others had seen the UFO and, and the ultralights and said no, that these were completely different things. Uh, but the sightings continued. They spread out into the neighboring state of Connecticut and uh, lots of people saw this. Imbrogno dug in trying to find some official confirmation. He called the FAA. They denied everything, as did the police and most airport officials. Uh, but he did eventually find that inside source who said that the 
the ultralights was all about confusing the issue. The sightings slowed down a little bit in 1983 and came roaring back in uh, 1984. A lot of people saw these objects, as I said, over res reservoirs. And Jim Cook saw this object hovering over Croton Falls Reservoir, uh, 15 feet above the water, sending down beams of light. A few months later, in May 31st, it was back, again hovering over the highway, sending down beams of light, stopping traffic. And that's when, the, following this, the wave started to slow down. That appeared to be the climax of the whole wave. Uh, there were other sightings. Uh, some were very impressive. Uh, there was one witness who saw the object approach, and it changed size. It was very small, and then it expanded in size. So a lot of interesting sightings, but following this, the sightings slowed down and eventually stopped, or they were not being reported in at least as large numbers. The area still remains a major hot spot. Uh, Philip Imbrogno did write a book about it. He co-wrote it with J. Allen Hynek and Bob Pratt. It's called Night Siege. I d highly recommend it. I also recommend the sequel to the book. Uh, just one of the most amazing UFO waves in history. A final incident of the Hudson Valley UFO wave I'd like to mention is the incredible encounters at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. This occurred on July 24, 1984. An object hovered about 300 feet over the exhaust tower at Reactor 3 for at least 15 minutes. It was seen by about 70 people. It was photographed the entire time, filmed, and caused quite a bit of consternation. They had their guns pointed at it. This remained covered up. Philip and Brogno uh, found out about it and actually got permission to interview one of the security guards. At that point, officials at the power plant denied it, the interview, and, and Brogno threatened to go public if they didn't allow him to interview the security officer. <laughs> so they relented, and this is how Brogno got the whole story. And it's an incredible story. It turns out there was a week, a sighting a week before it. And again, this, this object was hovering over the same reactor. And eventually, uh, they inspected this reactor and found what appeared to be some sort of irregularity. So it could be this UFO is there for a reason, trying to help, or at least send some sort of a message. Uh, but the story doesn't end there. Philip and Brogno has talked to witnesses who said, who've said they've seen actual gray ETs moving through the walls and moving around this base. And also, when this object showed up on and hovered over Reactor 3, it shut down the base's entire security system. All the computers went dark, and uh, all the alarms were no longer functional. So it could have also been some sort of a display of their ability to shut this nuclear power base down if they wanted to. Hard to say. So Philip and Brogno got a lot of repercussions, he says, from investigating this incident. He was warned to not research it by the New York Power Authority, he says. And he began to get audited by the IRS year, several years in a row. And as he says, and I'm quoting, it's hard to believe that people like John Lear and Bill Cooper are revealing top secret information with little or no repercussions. I just poked my nose a little too deep into an area of national security, and I got my ears pinned back for it. If I really wanted to go into this with no fear of what would happen to me, I'm sure there's an incredible story here. I'm still being gi given information about certain things. In the nighttime, people seeing little creatures coming through the walls of the casing on the reactor, and military personnel indicating we're aware of these creatures and we don't care if they're from outer space, shoot them. So an incredible case. And one tiny, one more tiny little event, because I just, I, I have to mention it. This occurred on August 25th, 1985, when a man by the name of Greg Boone, who was actually a reporter for the Poughkeepsie Journal, was uh, in the offices of the newspaper with 10 other reporters when this huge object comes traveling leisurely by the building. Within just a few hundred feet, they all saw it. 
and they quickly wrote up a news story to report it, thinking this was going to be front page news, and were shocked when their superiors quashed the story. They nixed it and didn't want to talk about it. And that the next day, uh, s men in suits came up and told them not to talk about it. So definitely a huge, huge event, the Hudson Valley UFO wave, and that's why I gave it number two. And now we get to number one, drum roll. It is the 1965 New York blackout. Some of you may be surprised that I chose this one, but I think it's the most influential UFO event in New York history, and that's why I gave it the number one spot. On September 22, 1965, there was a wave of sightings over Buffalo, Lewiston, Clarence, Niagara, North Tonawanda. This appears to be the preliminary sort of uh, beginning of this wave of sightings which was about to occur and cause this huge, huge event. It was one and a half months later, on November 9th, 1965, that it happened, the Great New York Blackout. Uh, this was one of the largest power blackouts in United States history. It involved 80,000 square miles, 5 million homes, 36 million people, and affected about one-fifth of the U.S. population, actually including my own father. He was there. Uh, officials eventually tracked the problem, the cause of the blackout, to a faulty relay at the Sir Adam Beck plant in number two in Clay, New York. Uh, however, uh, at the same time, <laughs> there was a lot of reports coming in ab of UFOs. Uh, not just a few, hundreds from all across this area. And it's clearly connected to these, this power blackout because it occurred at exactly the same time. Uh, the night before this whole incident, there was a sighting. A bunch of boys saw a UFO moving over the Syracuse dormita dormitory. But on November 9th, 1965, at the time of this blackout, Robert C. Walsh, the Deputy City Aviation Commissioner in Syracuse, was flying at 1,500 feet over the city when the power went out. Uh, he immediately landed and observed, along with several others, a 50-foot wide glowing spherical object rise up and take off overhead at about 100 feet elevation. At the same time of the Robert Walsh sighting, there was another pilot who saw it. It was flight instructor Weldon Ross and his student James Brooking. They were flying over Syracuse Airport and watched as this object actually followed the telephone wires towards the Niagara Falls power plant. Many, many witnesses, some of high level. One great witness is Church Sexton William Stilwell of St. Paul's Episcopal Church. He had a 117 power telescope and these objects showed up and he observed them through his telescope for a period of about two hours. He was actually able to take several photos, two of which were published in the New York Herald Journal and it turned out he had been seeing these objects for several months since August, four months earlier and was afraid to tell people because of how they would react. Many people took photographs of this object, including a photographer for Life magazine by the name of Arthur Rickerby. Uh, he was there when the blackout occurred, ran outside. He and hundreds of other people saw this object. He snapped a photo, which was actually published in Life magazine in the November 19, 1965 issue. There are other photos. One report comes from researcher Antonio Junius, who writes, and I'm quoting, Many UFOs were taken around the period of the Great Blackout of 1965, including one that shows a totally black, saucer-shaped figure flying very close to the Empire State Building, precisely at the point of the huge antenna at the top. Um, there are far too many witnesses to, to list here, but there are some famous ones. Uh, Renato Pacini, uh, he worked with the Symphony Orchestra in Indianapolis, uh, he and a bunch of other people saw six objects. Uh, families 
what came running out of their homes. People saw this while driving down the highway. Uh, and it was not only seen in Syracuse, but in surrounding areas such as Maddysdale, and literally they found out surrounding states. The Syracuse Herald Journal received more than 100 reports of UFOs in the days and weeks that followed, uh, mostly from Syracuse in this one area, uh, but all over uh, the surrounding states uh, where all this power had gone off. So it wasn't apparently just one object, it was many, many objects. And this is where it gets really interesting. And here's an aspect of the New York blackout story that I don't think a lot of people <laughs> know about. And one of the reasons I gave it first place. Uh, this comes from an, a witness, an actor by the name of Stuart Whitman. And he tells an incredible story. According to Stuart Whitman, he was in his 12-story New York hotel room when he heard his name being called like a loudspeaker in English, and he saw two egg-shaped objects hovering outside the window. One was blue, one was orange. These were fairly large. Uh, then this voice shouted out to Whitman that he was being contacted because he had no malice or hatred. And these ETs, if that's what they were, gave him this message. And I'll just quote Stuart Whitman here because it's a pretty amazing story. As he says, they were concerned about our continued use of uncontrolled nuclear weapons and about the chaos and lack of morality now in existence on our planet. They informed me that they will definitely interfere if we go too far in our warlike attitudes. They claim that they are able to stop all electrical apparatus from functioning and could put a halt to our normal everyday activities anytime they wanted to. The voice proceeded to tell Stuart that they had contacted other people. Apparently no one else has come forth, but according to Stuart Whitman, and I'm quoting again, they gave their message to all those with ears that will hear. They, they told him that the blackout had been a demonstration, but that their only concern was the welfare of humanity. As Stuart Whitman says, and again I'm quoting, they requested that I attempt to assist in any possible manner their campaign to wipe out racial prejudice, hatred, bigotry, and war from our planet. I was not frightened, but strangely elated. I had no fear, as I somehow knew they would do me no harm. I don't know why they picked me as a contact, but I'll swear on a Bible that I saw them out there and that they talked to me. So many, many witnesses in a very complicated case. Many researchers have looked into this. Ralph and Judy Bloom looked into it immediately after it happened and learned that it was causing waves at very high levels. Officials were concerned that it, it was, as Stuart Whitman had said, a demonstration of their power. And uh, this caused waves all the way up to Congress. In 1968, three years later, Congress held a congressional hearing on UFOs and the great New York blackout certainly came up. Researcher James McDonald was one of the presenters and uh, he definitely had something to say about what happened on that night. And I'll quote him here as he says, Dr. Hynek would probably be the most appropriate man to describe the Manhattan sighting since he interviewed several witnesses involved. I interviewed a woman in Seacliff, New York. She saw a disc hovering and going up and down and then shooting away from New York just after the power failure. I went to the Federal Power Commission for data. They didn't take them seriously, although they had many dozens of sighting reports for that evening. There were reports all over New England in the midst of that blackout, and five witnesses near Syracuse saw a glowing object ascending within about a minute of the blackout. McDonald reported several other cases to the congressional officials and then concluded his report by saying, and again I'm quoting, just how a UFO could trigger an outage on a large power network is however not yet clear. But this is a disturbing series of coincidences that I think warrant much more attention than they have so far received. Congressman Ryan w was listening to uh, McDonald and asked McDonald, as far as you know, has any agency investigated the New York blackout in relation to UFOs? James McDonald replied, 
None at all. There is no one looking at this relation between UFOs and outages. Congressman Ryan then asked one final question. He says, one final question. Do you think it is imperative that the Federal Power Commission or Federal Communications Commission investigate the relationship between the sightings and the blackout? Dr. McDonald replied, My position would call for a somewhat weaker adjective. I'd say extremely desirable. So that's my list of the top 20 cases in New York. I researched all these cases for my book, UFOs Over New York. Uh, there were lots of others I wanted to include, but as you can see, this has already gone way too long. I hope I've included the most important cases. And uh, for those of you who have stuck around all the way to the end, thanks very much. And hope you enjoyed it and keep having fun.